Welcome to week six of the music of the Rolling Stones, 1962 to 1974. This week, we're going to focus on just one album, Exile on Main Street. Uh, it's almost like we're talking about two albums as we have done in previous uh, um, weeks, two studio albums, that is, because Exile on Main Street is a double album. Um, and so, like, for example, the Beatles' White Album, it's got a lot of music on it. Um, so we're going to focus on just that album this week, um, and we're going to consider it to be kind of a classic Stones album. That's been the kind of critical reception. Because it's a classic Stones album and it's coming almost at the very end of the course, it's going to give us a chance to um, look at the album and not only look at it for what it, it is as, as the, next, uh, the next album in the sequence that we've been talking about, but also to use it as a lens through which to look at the music of the Rolling Stones and summarize some of the things that we've been talking about uh, in the weeks uh, leading up to this week. So um, we'll, we'll use it as a way of looking at uh, song styles and influences. Uh, we'll, we'll use the album and, and this, this week as also a way of looking at the history of concert tours, kind of pulling together the kind of things that we've been talking about over the last five weeks, uh, and also talk a, a bit about the history of the recording studios and the various studios uh, that the Stones of you. So in many ways, uh, this week is not only going to focus on Exile on Main Street, but it's going to be kind of a summary or a kind of a taking stock of where we are uh, thus far. And then we'll finish up uh, in week seven by coming back to Goat's Head Soup and It's Only Rock and Roll. So as we begin, uh, this uh, this week, let's do a little bit of a kind of a historical survey of the kinds of things that are happening in 1971 uh, and 1972 uh, for the Rolling Stones as they they make their way from Sticky Fingers uh, to Exile on Main Street. Uh, what the Rolling Stones discovered about their business dealings, and we talked a bit about Alan Klein and, and all of that, but whatever one believes about whether they were being treated fairly by their management or not, there was one thing that, that became clear to them um, as they were coming to the end of 1970 and the end of 1971, and that is that they owed a lot of taxes that had never been paid to the British government. So. The way the taxation was at that time, it was extremely high um, in, in the 80s percentage-wise for some kinds of investments, it was into the 90s. It meant that it was almost impossible to make enough money <laughs> to be able to keep enough of it to be able to pay off the tax debt that you owed. So you had to figure out a way of making that money and not paying the taxes on it so that you could use that money to pay the taxes that you already owed. Anyway, this was the, this was the way the thing was sized up um, by Prince Rupert Lowenstein, who had uh, started to work uh, with the Stones business and, and, and their money and the financial uh, end of things. And so the Stones decided that what they would do is they would, um, they would uh, uh, move out of the country. They were advised to move out of the country to go become tax exiles. And maybe if you've read a lot about a lot of other bands big bands uh, during the early 1970s. A lot of them did this tax exile strategy. They were f became formally resident somewhere else so they didn't have to pay these, these high taxes uh, back to the British government. So this is what the Stones did, and primarily not because they wanted to leave the UK, but because they had to be able to make enough money, uh, as I say, uh, to pay their taxes. And so as we get to the schedule of what's happening in 1971 for them, they do a tour that's called Goodbye Britain <laughs> in March 1971, where they basically do a British tour uh, where they're basically saying, well, we're going to be out of the country for a while, so here's a tour that, uh, that says goodbye. Um, the uh, the uh, album Sticky Fingers is released in April of 1971, and as we talked about last week, it's the first record to be on the Rolling Stones new label uh, called Rolling Stones Records, which was announced at the same time, about the same time as Sticky Fingers was released in April of 1971. Marshall Chess is running uh, that label for them. And so, uh, as we talked about, the DECA deal had expired. They decided to do their own deal, make their, make their own, uh, have their own record company, but it would be distributed through Atlantic. Marshall Chess took over. So all this is happening at the beginning of 1971 uh, as the group are, are becoming tax exiles and leaving the country. Uh, they're releasing stick, Sticky Fingers. And on to move, they move on to recording uh, the next album. So it turns out that they moved to France. And the various members of the Rolling Stones ended up, mostly the south of France, ended up uh, finding um, 
places to rent, long-term long -term rentals. Uh, uh, Charlie Watts, I think, he actually even bought the home that he used uh, during this period. They found rentals, but they were, for some reason, these, these rentals that they got were, you know, geographically not really close to each other. Bill Wyman had a long drive from where he was staying to where they ended up doing a lot of the recording, which was in the house, that the big mansion that Keith Richards uh, was renting. Uh, but for what, whatever those reasons were, that's the way it was. So they were kind of scattered around uh, in the south of France there, and their, ma their main street was pretty much the kind of uh, the, the Riviera Strip there, uh, where there was a, a, lot of, um, a lot of fun stuff uh, going on. So. Um, they record uh, most of the tracks that are going to be uh, on Exile on Main Street, plus others. Um, they record at least the initial versions or the backing tracks or initial versions of these things uh, during the period between June and October of 1971 at this uh, mansion that Keith uh, Richards is renting called Villa Nelcot. Um, sorry for my French pronunciation for those of you who are uh, picky about that kind of thing. Um, Anyway, so, so they, they, when they first went to France uh, in April, May 1971, they kind of looked around for recording studios. And they realized that there wasn't really anything for them in any of the towns around where they were planning on um, uh, uh, living. You know, the, the equipment wasn't good enough. But they, it, it occurred to them, look, we have this mobile recording studio, the Rolling Stones mobile truck. You know, they'd used it at Star Groves and that kind of thing. So they brought it over. They set it up at, at the place that Keith was at, and they used the, most of the basement of that as their kind of recording stuff, and they had cables going out to the recording truck and this kind of thing, and it kind of became their very elaborate home studio where a lot of these things uh, were uh, recorded. During the course of that the time they were recording there at Keith's place, it kind of also became hangout central uh, for everybody. This is where people would, get, where not only where the band would hang out, but wives and significant others, uh, friends, people would come through. A lot of times it would just be one big party uh, going on. And that worked for a while, but it, the, after the summer sort of expired and we started to get Get into October of 1971, uh, the Rolling Stones started to get word that if they didn't clear out, there might be a drug bust. Um, one can imagine that uh, perhaps the people in the uh, tourist community there had pretty much had enough of these Rolling Stones. It had been fine while they were there uh, in the summer, bringing their friends and spending a lot of money and creating some celebrity. But now they were going into the off season, and maybe it was time uh, to get rid of these guys and send them packing. And so uh, they left. Um, France in October of 71, and the recording moved to L.A., where it would have gone anyway in order to finish up the album. It's just that there was a lot more recording that was done, and um, uh, interesting people come into the picture, musicians and things come into the picture uh, during L.A., and they continue working on that album until March of 1972. Uh, in April 1972, the single Tumbling Dice uh, is released with Sweet Black Angel uh, as the B-side. Tumbling Dice goes to number uh, seven in the U.S. and number five in the U.K. And at the same time, uh, Exile on Main Street, uh, just well, at the same time, just a month later, Exile on Main Street is released in May of 1972. And then after they feel like Tumbling Dice has had its sort of time on the charts, and it seems to be coming down the charts, they released the song Happy, also from Exile on Main Street, with All Down the Line um, on the B-side in July of 1972, and Happy goes to number 22 uh, in the U.S. So that gives us a sense of what's going on with the Rolling Stones at the beginning of 1971. They leave the U.K. as tax exiles. They do a little bit of a, a tour before that. They move to France, recording through most of the summer into the fall. That, that scene sort of dries up on them uh, in various kinds of ways, and so then they move the party to L.A., uh, where they work on the album until March of 72. They bring out a single, Tumbling Dice, in April. They bring out an album in May, and then um, another single uh, in the summer of, uh, of 1972. Before we move on to talking about the album Exile on Main Street in more detail, however, let's just say a couple of words about some of the personal and personnel matters uh, that were going on in the Rolling Stones. And I should say, you may have noticed that during, during this course, I have kind of avoided talking a lot about the personal 
romantic relationships and various kind of liaisons with members of the band and some of the kind of more sensational and titillating sort of personal uh, stuff. And that's on purpose. Uh, you can get all that information uh, somewhere else. A lot of it is just he said, she said, here's what I saw kind of thing going on. Uh, but I, I think it probably is worth sort of mentioning some of these kinds of things. Um, for example, during this time in May of 1971, Mick Jagger gets married to Bianca. Uh, uh, and this sort of introduce him, introduces him to a kind of a jet set lifestyle, which becomes a very big, uh, important part of Mick's, you know, life and image uh, during uh, certainly the first half of the 1970s. Um, information I have says that when they were married in May of 1971, um, she was already pregnant with their, bought, their daughter, who would be born in October, by the name of Jade. Uh, so. What we see with, with Bianca here is, of course, the thing with Marianne Faithful is over, a traumatic experience for Mick and all that went with that, and now uh, he's married to uh, Bianca Jagger. At about the same time, Keith descends into heavy drug use. So, you know, Keith would, um, well, he, he was, was a hardworking guy when he was doing the music, but when he wasn't doing the music, a lot of times he was... Uh, he was abusing uh, substances, uh, but he remained it. He remained very productive artistically, uh, in spite of this. Uh, during a lot of this period, uh, well, all of this period and period before and the period after, uh, Keith's significant other was Anita Pallenberg. All kinds of stories about Keith and Anita and Brian and Mick and all this kind of thing. We don't need to get into it, but just to know that there were these women in the situation with the Stones there when they were in France, sort of, you know, creating a certain element of domestic life for them while they were recording this album. Uh, during uh, this period, Charlie and Bill, Charlie Watts and Bill Wyman, are somewhat less involved in many of the sessions uh, with Keith. Richards and Mick Taylor playing bass on some of the tracks instead of Bill Wyman and Jimmy Miller uh, playing drums uh, now and again. Um, this is because of the kind of round-the-clock recording schedule that they would um, uh, that they would employ. It was basically when Keith felt like he wanted to record, whoever was there would show up and he would they would start recording and what, what happened would happen. And you know, for the guys who lived an hour, two hours drive away, whatever, to, to be there at the time when that was happening, very difficult. So they ended up participating maybe less than they would have had, these th has the, had this thing been a little bit more structured. That it was unstructured meant that it could be creative in all kinds of ways that you could never be if you had to book a three hour slot at Olympic Studios, say for example, or RCA Studios uh, like that. So that gives us a little bit of a mapping of what's going on in 1971 or 1972 for the Stones. So now let's take a close look at this album, Exile on Main Street. 